Hello chemists, this is Ms. Placino and you are watching Screencast 11.4, An Introduction to Equilibrium. In today's lesson, we're going to look at different equilibrium systems, three of them to be exact, and the different characteristics they exhibit, because they all have things in common. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with just a quick definition of what equilibrium is. Equilibrium is a state where two opposing processes are occurring at equal rates. Every system that's at equilibrium, whether it is chemical or physical in nature, are going to have two processes that are the opposite of one another. And these processes are going to occur at equal rates or at equal speeds. Uh, so let's look at an example that has nothing to do with chemistry first. When you take a look at this picture or this GIF, hopefully it's pretty obvious what the two opposing processes are. Um, we've got this guy bailing water out of the boat using the bucket, and then we have water coming into the boat, presumably through a hole in the bottom of the boat. I know these processes are opposite of one another because one's bringing water into the boat, the other is putting water out of the boat. How can I tell if they're occurring, um, how can I tell if they're occurring at equal rates? If I look at the water level in the boat, that's going to tell me if we're at equal rates or not. Um, if the water level is changing, for example, it's getting higher, uh, it's safe to assume that the water coming into the boat is occurring at a fa faster rate than water is being thrown out of the boat. If the water level is decreasing, I can assume that the rate of water being thrown out of the boat is greater than the rate of water coming into the boat. But if I look at this example, the water level doesn't seem to be changing. The boat's bobbing back and forth a little bit as the water is being thrown out, but it doesn't seem like the overall water level is changing. This is what a system at equilibrium looks like. The overall net change is zero, but the processes are still occurring. One common misconception with equilibrium is that the reactions have stopped occurring, and that's definitely not the case. If I wanted to try to represent this GIF with a chemical reaction, it might look something like this. Water in, and then I have this reversible looking arrow, kind of split, half of it's forward, half of it's reverse, water out. This is a new symbol that we're going to be using in our equations, and it does not mean at equilibrium. It simply means reversible. So let's spend a little bit more time talking about that. In order for equilibrium to be established, we have to have processes that are reversible. So we'll look at a simplified version of a chemical equation. A is in a reversible reaction with B. What that technically means is that you've got two reactions occurring. A turns into B. It's what we call our forward reaction, as it's from uh, the same way you read, left to right. And once you've built up some B, B is going to react and form A. We call this the reverse reaction, since it's from right to left. Again, that double-headed arrow does not mean that this is at equilibrium. It simply means that the process itself is reversible. Uh, the majority of the reactions that we've looked at this semester are not reversible. Um, or I should say this, this entire year. If you think about precipitation reactions, where you have aqueous solutions reacting to form a solid precipitate, uh, that's not readily reversible. So we have to write that with a forward reaction only. Only certain reactions are going to be able to be reversed. And you're not going to be expected to really know which ones are and are not reversible simply by looking at the reactants and the products. But you should know what these different arrows mean. So let's look at a couple different equilibrium systems. Uh, this is one that we should be familiar with as we've talked about it a couple times now. Phase equilibrium exists between the li uh, liquid and vapor phases. So we've got, in this case, an Erlenmeyer flask with some liquid in it. We've stoppered it closed. Key to an equilibrium system, it has to be a closed system. Um, and in this case, we'll have some of the liquid molecules evaporating and forming a vapor and some of the vapor molecules are going to condense and become liquid. Once equilibrium has been established, that means that the rate of vaporization or evaporation, whatever you'd like to think of it as, is equal to the rate of condensation. So if those rates are equal, that means that the total number of particles in the vapor phase is going to stay constant. So from an outside perspective, uh, vapor pressure would remain constant, 
that it would look like nothing was changing. But if we could see down on the molecular level, we'd see that some of the gas particles were condensing, some of the liquid particles were evaporating, and that just both processes were occurring at the same rate. If I wanted to express this in a chemical equation, I might write something like this. Um, H2O liquid is in a reversible reaction with H2O gas. Um, doesn't really matter whether I put the liquid on the reactant side or the product side. I just happen to choose it this way, but this is reversible, so it does not particularly matter. Solutions can exist in equilibrium. Um, only one of the different states that we talked about in the last unit exists at equilibrium. Do you remember what it is? It's our saturated solutions only. In a saturated solution, um, what two processes are going to be equal to one another? And you've got a clue in uh, the little picture up above the test tube. In the case of a saturated solution, the rate of dissolving of your solute is equal to the rate of recrystallization of your solute. So again, if you could see down into the molecular level, what's happening kind of at the interface between all that excess solute that's in there and the saturated solution, you would see that the, um, some of the solute particles are starting to recrystallize. They're going to join together and reform the crystal lattice. At the same time, some of those um, parts of the crystal lattice are going to dissociate. They're going to break apart and become ions, be surrounded by water molecules, and float around. The net change, again, is equal to zero, but that does not mean that these two processes have stopped occurring. So I could write this equilibrium uh, like this. Calcium fluoride solid, and I might want to put water over that reversible reaction arrow, it is going to be in a reversible reaction with a calcium ion and two fluoride ions. Most of what we look at this uh, unit is going to be chemical equilibrium. In order for a system to attain chemical equilibrium, we have to have a reversible reaction. Hopefully no surprises there. And generally speaking, just the rate of the forward reaction has to be equal to the rate of the reverse reaction, things we've talked about already. There's a really important equilibrium that has to be maintained. Um, Hb is supposed to represent hemoglobin, and O2 is, of course, oxygen. And then on the product side, we have the hemoglobin and oxygen complex. So when you breathe in, the red blood cells, more specifically the hemoglobin and the red blood cells, are going to trap oxygen molecules so the oxygen can be circulated around your body. This exists at equilibrium. Wouldn't do your body any good if this wasn't reversible. Hemoglobin would hold on to the oxygen and not release it to the different organs and tissues that require oxygen to keep you alive. Uh, so it's a very good thing that this process is reversible. Okay, so we've got two different graphs that we can use to talk about or kind of show what happens when a system reaches equilibrium. Uh, we can think about what's happening in terms of the concentration of the products and the reactants, or we can think about it in terms of the rates of the forward and the reverse reaction. Uh, let's start with rates first, since I feel like this is something we've drilled home many, many times during this lesson. So as far as the rates are concerned, once equilibrium has been established, rates are equal. And if we wanted to try to represent that with a graph, and we'll have uh, red is equal to forward, we'll make blue equal to reverse. As the reaction progresses, the forward reaction rate is going to slow down. The reverse reaction rate is going to speed up. And we'll know that we're at equilibrium. You'll write this in there with green. Equilibrium when they are the same. Uh, so the forward reaction initially starts off very fast because you've got a high concentration of reactants, and then the reverse reaction is non-existent initially um, because there are no products. Um, but as the reaction progresses, you get less and less pro uh, reactants, you get more and more products, so the reverse reaction will pick up in rate, the, reverse, the forward reaction will slow down, and they'll meet um, not necessarily right in the middle, uh, but you'll get to a point where the rates are going to be equal to each other. So that's what a graph would look like um, between the reaction rates once equilibrium has been established.
We can also think about what's happening to the concentration of the products and the reactants at equilibrium. At equilibrium, concentrations of products and reactants are constant. They do not have to be equal to one another. They just have to be constant. Uh, so let's make red the concentration of the products. It's a very large letter P. Let's make blue the concentration of the reactants. Initially, we'll start off with a high concentration of reactants, and as the reaction progresses, it's going to drop. We'll start off with no products initially, but once the forward reaction starts taking place, we'll make some products, and as the reverse reaction kicks in, oops, the um, concentration of the products eventually will level off. This is equilibrium. This is when equilibrium has been established. The concentrations of the products and reactants do not have to be equal to one another. They just have to remain constant. That's because the rate of making products and the rate of making reactants are equal to one another. Um, so don't be confused with these two graphs. Make sure we know the difference, um, what happens with concentration and rates once equilibrium is established. All right, that's all I've got for today. I uh, hope you found this helpful, and thanks for tuning in.